Welcome to this week's episode of the Tin Dog Podcast. I apologise for the state of my voice last week. Hopefully, the volume's going to be a little bit better this week. And of course, this week, we're dealing with review of the first of the two-part story, The Daleks Take Manhattan. Now, from the Internet Movie Database, I can now read you this short breakdown of what the episode's about. A bunch of Daleks graduate from time school and set out to make it big on Broadway. On the way, they experiment with Miss Piggy and climax with a huge musical number, where, while standing on the top of the Empire State Building, they shoot King Kong. Yeah, alright, that's not quite true. But if you want to take a quick look at the artwork that's on the front of this podcast, you can see what I really do spend my time doing when I find myself with five minutes to spare. A small poster for the Daleks take Manhattan, but of course that's not what it's called. Everyone knows what it's called, it's already written down. We're dealing with the Daleks, we're dealing with 1930s America. We're dealing with, well, a rather nice little story. Unlike some two-parter or four-parter or some classic Doctor Who stories, you actually get to see the Daleks before the end of episode one. They actually turn up, which is lovely. I mean, let's face it, you usually had 25 minutes of padding, here's a bit of backstory, here's a bit, ooh, something's going on, and at the very end you would see a plunger or somebody would materialise and you'd go, oh, it's the Daleks, despite the fact that the episode was actually called something like Revenge, Return, Rejuvenation, Rerun of the Daleks, or whatever. Or something beginning with R of the Daleks, as it became towards the end of the classic series run. Of course, we are dealing primarily with the Daleks seen at the end of Doomsday. You've got the Cult of Scaro, which I am sure is going to become a band's name very, very shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, the Cult of Scaro. Crashing on where Dalek Sek, Dalek Jeff, Dalek Phil and Dalek Mike are all having hybrid fun in the basement of the Empire State using some rather charming people who they seem to have turned into pigs because they want to do a stage production of Animal Farm. Or is it the island of Dr Moreau? Or is it let's be the Slitheen? No, let's not go there either. Okay, I'm being kind of light-hearted, but that's mainly because I really enjoyed the story. It had a nice beginning, nice middle, nice build-up. You know, I mean... All right, it wasn't exactly a cliffhanger at the end, but it was a bit surprising, despite the fact that if you'd even seen a copy of the Radio Times, for our American viewers, the Radio Times is the English Listings magazine. The English TV Listings magazine. That wasn't an edit, that was just me doing a stupid voice. Anyway, the Radio Times rather stupidly put the Dalek stroke Dalek sec mutant thing on the front of the Radio Times with the Daleks are back. So it kind of removed the excitement of the end of the episode with you going, yep, seen that. And you kind of spent the whole of the episode going, yep, we'll be building up to that later. Now, I know the whole point of the BBC is to appeal to the non-Doctor Who fans to get them to watch. Because let's face it, the Doctor Who fans will watch anyway. So we're kind of a powerless majority, or should that be minority? For example, at work the other day, somebody's mobile phone started ringing and it was the Doctor Who theme tune, and it wasn't my mobile phone. It's kind of messing with me. I almost want to shout, Give me my show back! You weren't there at the beginning! But I've risk, run the risk of becoming part of the cast of Spaced. The funniest thing that I've seen this week is on the BBC website. If you go to the gallery page and have a look at the stills of all of the um, shows that you can download as uh, wallpapers, one of them is of Dalek Sec, the Black Dalek. And it actually says at the bottom, Sec in the city. And I um, I laughed for about a minute on that one. I would download it, but you know, it doesn't actually see it on the screen. Crashing on. I know it's a two-parter, and I know you have to lay a lot of more groundwork in a two-parter, but it does have the now the same running length as a classic Doctor Who series. And you can tell. There feels like there's more characterization. There feels like there's more space to breathe. I know they had to go to New York for four days. And of course, David Tennant and Freema didn't actually get to go to New York. So everything's green screened or put in afterwards. But it's still exceptionally well done. I would definitely recommend this to, uh, to anyone as a great introduction to the series. This series has been very strong. And it's one of the better looking episodes. 
I was watching the 2005 season, uh, moments from it, and it does have a distinct glow to it, which you don't normally get. Anyway, I am kind of wobbling on. The hybrid fun with the squid head monster thing. My friend Andy has got this suggestion that one day the rights to use the Dalek will run out. Uh, for example, at the end of this year, in fact, when the nation estate go, you know, they're quite popular. Could we have a bit more cash? And of course, if our lovely producer has redesigned the Daleks to such an extent that they just look like a man with a squid head, he can quite easily turn around and go, you know, these aren't really Daleks anymore. But then, of course, every time they get mentioned, they'd have to pay out. So it's not really going to work. It's a lovely idea, but I can't see it working. And let's face it, the Daleks are the ultimate in racial purity. They are Nazis, as opposed to the way they appeared at the end of the 2005 season, which was religious fundamentalists. I'm digressing. Marvellously, and unlike the other series where you had a mention of Torchwood every week and you were kind of ticking it off, there was, this week, as with last week, no mention of Mr Saxon, which I'm quite pleased about. Now, my friend also suggests that Mr Saxon is an anagram of Master Number 6, the, here the number being replaced by N-O, so it's Master No 6. Now, that's because he thinks that um, the new person, possibly called Sim, playing the Master, is the sixth actor to play the Master. Now, at this point, I had a word with him and went, you know, are you sure it's number six? Because at the time I could work out four. I mean, let's look at it. We've got, there's Anthony Ainley, you know, the, the doctor for the fifth, sixth, well, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh doctor this time. You've got obviously Delgado and you've got Jeffrey Beavers. They were the ones I could come up with straight off the top of my head. But then he has a bit of a think and he goes, well, Obviously, Eric Roberts, so that's another one. And then he says, Gordon Tipple. Now, at this point, I go, who? Apparently, Gordon Tipple is the actor who um, plays the master at the very, very beginning of the McGann film when he gets shot. Now, I'm thinking, that's a bit tenuous. It's a bit dodgy. And I'm sure you could class somebody else as the fifth master, if you see what I mean. I mean, let's face it, he's only in it for a couple of seconds. So you could have um, the master as heard or seen or almost seen in Scream of the Shalkra. Uh, but then, of course, you've got... Yes, we all know that that's not really... It's the alternative Ninth Doctor. You can download it. It's not important. I will do a podcast on that at some point. Perhaps there's another actor that they're thinking of. Either way, I'm sure we'll learn more about the apparent Mr. Saxon later on. I'll call this an end, because obviously it's a two-part story. There's some very nice performances, there's some lovely sets. I know you've watched it, I know you've enjoyed it. Hopefully my voice will stay like this standard in future. Speak to you next week. Be seeing you.